they also acknowledge that the saints are still so liable to the disease of concupiscence that though opposing it they cannot avoid being ever and anon prompted and incited to lust avarice ambition or other vices it is unnecessary to spend much time in investigating the sentiments of ancient writers augustine alone may suffice as he has collected all their opinions with great care and fidelity any reader who is desirous to know the sense of antiquity may obtain it from him there is this difference apparently between him and us that while he admits that believers so long as they are in the body are so liable to concupiscence that they cannot but feel it he does not venture to give this disease the name of sin he is contented with giving it the name of infirmity and says that it only becomes sin when either external act or consent is added to conception or apprehension that is when the will yields to the first desire we again regard it as sin whenever man is influenced in any degree by any desire contrary to the will of god nay we maintain that the very gravity which begets in us such desires is sin accordingly we hold that there is always sin in the saints until they are freed from their mortal frame because depraved concupiscence resides in their flesh and is at variance with rectitude augustine himself does not always refrain from using the name of sin as when he says quote, paul gives the name of sin to that carnal concupiscence from which all sins arise this in regard to the saints loses its dominion in this world and is destroyed in heaven End quote. in these words he admits that believers in so far as they are liable to carnal concupiscence are chargeable with sin 11. When it is said that God purifies his church so as to be holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, that he promises this cleansing by means of baptism and performs it in his elect, I understand that reference is made to the guilt rather than to the matter of sin. In regenerating his people, God indeed accomplishes this much for them. He destroys the dominion of sin by supplying the agency of the spirit which enables them to come off victorious from the contest sin however though it ceases to reign ceases not to dwell in them accordingly though we say that the old man is crucified and the law of sin is abolished in the children of god romans six verse six the remains of sin survive not to have dominion but to humble them under a consciousness of their infirmity we admit that these remains, just as if they had no existence, are not imputed, but we at the same time contend that it is owing to the mercy of God that the saints are not charged with the guilt which would otherwise make them sinners before God. It will not be difficult for us to confirm this view, seeing we can support it by clear passages of Scripture. How can we express our view more plainly than Paul does in Romans 7 verse 6? We have elsewhere shown, and Augustine by solid reasons proves, that Paul is there speaking in the person of a regenerated man. I say nothing as to his use of the words evil and sin. However, those who object to our view may quibble on these words, can any man deny that aversion to the law of God is an evil, and that hindrance to righteousness is sin? In short, who will not admit that there is guilt where there is spiritual misery? but all these things Paul affirms of his disease. Again, the law furnishes us with a clear demonstration by which the whole question may be quickly disposed of. We are enjoined to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. Since all the faculties of our soul ought thus to be engrossed with the love of God, it is certain that the commandment is not fulfilled by those who receive the smallest desire into their heart, or admit into their minds any thought whatever which may lead them away from the love of God to vanity. What then? Is it not through the faculties of mind that we are assailed with sudden motions, that we perceive sensual or form conceptions of mental objects? Since these faculties give admission to vain and wicked thoughts, do they not show that to that extent they are devoid of the love of God? He, then, who admits not that all the desires of the flesh are sins, 
and that that disease of concupiscence, which they call a stimulus, is a fountain of sin, must of necessity deny that the transgression of the law is sin. 12. If any one thinks it is absurd thus to condemn all the desires by which man is naturally affected, seeing they have been implanted by God, the author of nature, we answer that we by no means condemn those appetites which God so implanted in the mind of man at his first creation, that they cannot be eradicated without destroying human nature itself, but only the violent lawless movements which war with the order of God. But as, in consequence of the corruption of nature, all our faculties are so vitiated and corrupted, that a perpetual disorder and excess is apparent in all our actions, and as the appetites cannot be separated from this excess, we maintain that therefore they are vicious, or, to give the substance in fewer words, we hold that all human desires are evil, and we charge them with sin, not in as far as they are natural, but because they are inordinate, and inordinate because nothing pure and upright can proceed from a corrupt and polluted nature. Nor does Augustine depart from this doctrine in reality so much as in appearance. From an excessive dread of the invidious charge with which the Pelagians assailed him, he sometimes refrains from using the term sin in this sense. But when he says that the law of sin remaining in the saints, the guilt only is taken away, he shows clearly enough that his view is not very different from ours. 13. We will produce some other passages to make it more apparent what his sentiments were. In his second book against Julian, he says, quote, This law of sin is both remitted in spiritual regeneration and remains in the mortal flesh, remitted because the guilt is forgiven in the sacrament by which believers are regenerated, and yet remains inasmuch as it produces desires against which believers fight. End quote. Again, quote, therefore the law of sin, which was in the members of this great apostle also, is forgiven in baptism, not ended. End quote. Again, quote, the law of sin, the guilt of which, though remaining, is forgiven in baptism, Ambrose called iniquity, for it is iniquitous for the flesh to lust against the spirit. End quote. Again, quote, sin is dead in the guilt by which it bound us and until it is cured by the perfection of burial, though dead it rebels. End quote. In the fifth book he says still more plainly, quote, As blindness of heart is the sin by which God is not believed, and the punishment of sin by which a proud heart is justly punished, and the cause of sin, when through the error of a blinded heart any evil is committed, so the lust of the flesh, against which the good spirit wars, is also sin, because disobedient to the authority of the mind, and the punishment of sin, because the recompense rendered for disobedience, and the cause of sin, consenting by revolt or springing up through contamination. End quote. He here without ambiguity calls it sin, because the Pelagian heresy being now refuted, and the sound doctrine confirmed, he was less afraid of calumny. Thus also, in his forty-first homily on John, where he speaks his own sentiments without controversy, he says, quote, If with the flesh you serve the law of sin, do what the apostle himself says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Romans 6.12 He does not say, Let it not be, but let it not reign. As long as you live, there must be sin in your members, but at least let its dominion be destroyed. Do not what it orders. End quote. Those who maintain that concupiscence is not sin are wont to found on the passage of James. Quote, then, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. James 1.15. But this is easily refuted. For unless we understand him as speaking only of wicked works or actual sins, even a wicked inclination will not be accounted sin. But from his calling crimes and wicked deeds the fruits of lust, and also giving them the name of sins, it does not follow that the lust itself is not an evil, and in the sight of God deserving of condemnation. 